C. Bronner. We focus in this session on the spiritual dimension that man is. Paul would pr uh, praying. He would say, "I pray that God would preserve you, body, soul, and spirit." We are spiritual beings. We are a spirit being. We're not humans trying to have a a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings living a human experience. We are spiritual beings. Touch yourself. Say, "I'm a spirit." You really are. You're, you're a spiritual being. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever think that you are flesh and blood. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against the rulers of darkness of this world. We, we're, we're dealing with wicked spirits in the heavenlies. How many single folks in the house? If you're single, raise your hand. Oh, my God. Wow. Where are the married people? My goodness, they're probably at home with the children. My goodness. My goodness, at home slaving, cleaning up, and doing all kinds of stuff. My goodness. Well, let me, let me give you, uh, I want to give the single people a, a, a checklist. Before you commit yourself to somebody in relationship, do, I want you to do what's called checkmate. You know, you're playing certain games, you said checkmate. You, you, you need to check your mate. And, and I want you to just, just make a note here to do a mindset check. See what kind of mindset this is. Don't, don't, don't go by how pretty their hair is, whether their cut is fresh or whether their hair is laid. Check what's underneath the hair. Go to their mindset. See what kind of mindset they have. And then do a personality check. Have you ever noticed good-looking people and then their personalities are ugly? Mindset check, personality check. Spiritual people are not dumb. When you're spiritual, the Spirit of God will lead you to do some things to help protect you. Touch your neighbor and say, checkmate. Oh, here's a major one. Here's a major one. Credit check. Don't go by what they drive and what kind of house they live in. You can't go by that because they might be mortgaged to the hilt. You need to know what shape that they're getting in. I'm not saying that you, you know, listen, what person is that that builds a house without first counting the cost? This is just a part of counting the cost. You need to know what you're getting into. Don't, don't, you know, here you are marrying somebody thinking that they're going to help you get out of your debt. And then you discover that your credit is better than theirs. They're trying to get on your insurance. <laughs> Credit check. Then you need to do a family background check. Listen, if all of their relatives are crazy, you better run. Half of them in jail. Listen, do, do, do a family background check. I'm just saying... Just check it out, just so you'll know what you're getting into. Now, you might check it out and find out some unpleasant thing, and you might still say, you know what? I still love him. I still, that's, he's still my boo. <laughs> but do a family background check. Here's a check as a part of a spiritual person, a prayer life check. Is the only time that they pray when they get ready to have a meal and that's the, the extent of their prayer life. That is the depth of their prayer life saying, you know, good God, good bread, good meat, <laughs> let's eat. Is, is that the extent of their, their prayer life? Then here, here what you do at the, at, at the airport, you do a baggage check. You need to check and see how much baggage this person is carrying because it, it's, it's not just who you see on the surface, that there's sometimes baggage that they have that just lined up sometimes for miles behind them. And you need to be able to count the cost and say, can I handle a person with this much baggage? And if they've got too much baggage, you know, you have to put a penalty on it. They will charge you for trying to travel now with too much baggage. Now, we ought to learn something from the airlines when it comes to getting in relationship. It's like, no, you, you got, you carrying too much stuff. I, I can't... 
I can't go with all of that. Then here's a very, very important checkmate here, attitude check. Oh, my goodness, attitude check, attitude check. Then, uh, then make sure to do a, a spirit check. Because sometimes a person can have everything that looks like is good, and something on the inside of you will say, you know, I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. Everything looks all right on the surface, but there's something about this deal that I just can't put my finger on. And God will be leading you in your spirit. Somehow your spirit says, I can't trust this person. It just a spirit check, a spirit check. And listen, if you don't have peace in your heart, peace is the greatest indication that you're in the will of God. And when you lose your peace, it is the greatest way of God saying that there's trouble in the camp. I'm trying to prevent you. It's, that's like all of the alarms are going off when God robs you of your peace. It's to let you know you're about to get into something that you, that you shouldn't get into. And then uh, you, you have to do nowadays a, a walk check. check. I'll call it a swagger check. The Bible says, see that you walk circumspectly. Sometimes you can look at a person's walk and tell something about their life. You can tell whether people have good uh, self-esteem or not just by their walk. Whether they're arrogant or have humility just by their walk. They could tell by Moses' walk because uh, that, that he was not the typical Hebrew slave, even though he was of Hebrew lineage. But he walked like a prince because he was raised in the palace. His walk gave him away. And there are some individuals that their walk and their talk don't match. So you have to do a swagger check. Because they'll be telling you that they're king, but they're walking like a pauper. <laughs> so always do a swagger check. Touch your neighbor, say checkmate. You have to watch the contacts of your spirit very, very carefully. Have you ever noticed this? That your, hear me carefully, touch your ears. Say, Lord, help me to hear this. Your dominant sin, your dominant sin in your life always seeks friendships to affirm it. Let me say that again. Your dominant sin in your life always seeks friendships to affirm it. So if a person is a gossip, guess who their friends will be? Other gossips. And if a person is a critic, guess who their friends will be? Other critics. They find other people with their same sin so that it normalizes it. Because if I've got a dominant sin that is ruling my life, why would I want to get around a saint who, being in their presence, brings conviction to me? So something in our nature, when we have a dominant sin in our life, it seeks friendships to affirm it. It says, I'm struggling with this, you're struggling with this, man, I know, isn't that the, isn't that the truth? You got two dope addicts. <laughs> Listen, both of y'all don't need to be struggling with crack. That's an unequal yoking. So you don't need friends that are struggling with your same issues. You need a friend who's got a strength in the area of your weakness. If you really want to keep your, your uh, spirit strong, there, there's something about it. Whatever is ruling our lives. If, if you've been abused, you want to build a friendship with somebody else who's been abused. Somebody else's spouse is beating them. You find somebody else who's been, Gary, your husband beat you too. No, I was just wearing my face, hair in my face because I thought it was cute. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Right. So it's amazing how whatever you struggle with, you'll see somebody else who's struggling with the same thing because it then normalizes our life. If you're around individuals that don't have your struggles, it shows that what you have is abnormal. And then it'll, it'll, that'll be more encouraging for us to then make the adjustment in our own life. Are you all getting anything out of this? And so, I think that we are oftentimes misguided until our spiritual dimension has been impacted. We are oftentimes misguided until our spiritual dimension has been impacted. Um, you remember Saul of Tarsus? He persecuted the Christians until a light from heaven came on the road to Damascus 
and his whole life changed and he became Paul the Apostle who stormed the very gates of Rome under the shadow of death to carry his glorious Lord's message to the needy and remember Peter who was fiery and impetuous and and this is the same Peter who was unwilling for Jesus to wash his feet Jesus got ready to wash his feet he said no Lord you're not gonna wash my feet and Jesus said listen if I don't do this then you're none of mine and he said Lord wash not only my feet wash my head my arms everything you know but in his human in his human weakness he denied the Lord three times and uh, but then he had an experience with God and he walked on the water and then he stood up on the day of Pentecost and he preached and 3,000 souls were added to the church you see you really honestly as a spirit being you have as much of God as you want you have as much of God as you want the only reason that you don't have more of God is because you don't want any more we only advance by doing you only advance by doing you don't advance by praying you advance by doing does that mean that you shouldn't pray absolutely not you ought to pray but you ought to pray and then you ought to do Moses kept praying and praying and then God says Moses quit your praying stop talking to me move the people forward move the people forward there comes a point that you don't grow you don't advance you don't progress unless you put your feet in motion you're not gonna get to where you need to be by praying to be there you gotta put your feet in motion you pray to get guidance and the blessings of God then put your feet in motion so there's something that always must be exercised I mean say your prayers tonight but unless you act on them tomorrow then they're, they're not worth very much you gotta act on them don't just say your prayers act on your prayers there was one man that was traveling in the Himalayas and before he started on the trip they were going to go over to some very precipitous mountains he decided that he would say a prayer over the car and they got in the car and soon after he got in the car even though he had prayed over the car the car ran hot because he had no uh, coolant in the radiator there was no coolant no water in the radiator the car ran hot and then they remedied that problem they got some water and put it in there and they were able to go on they went just a few miles on and then the car stopped again this time they were out of gas now what good does it do to pray over the car when you haven't put any water in the radiator and there's no gas in the tank and, and see and this is this is exactly what happened and so I mean I, I just I just dare you to begin putting your prayers into action it is one thing to pray and ask God for an answer it's another thing to receive an answer but the highest level is when you will be an answer when you begin to pray the prayer God make me an answer a real intercessor is one who becomes the answer to the problem when something really begins to burden your heart God will not uh, merely say you know if, you, if you're just praying a, a so-called intercessory prayer and I would hear people years ago saying you know God walk up and down the halls of the, of the hospital and go up, up and down the you know the convalescent home and, and God go and visit the, you know go to the prison Jesus and be with those who are in no 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 the only way that he's going there if he goes in you he wants to go in you you go to the hospital and let him use your hand and these signs shall follow them that believe they shall lay hands on the sick and, and, and then did, didn't Jesus said that in the last day that they would say to me you know uh, Lord Lord you know when were you in prison and we visited you not and he said because you did it not unto the least of these the brethren you did not do it unto me and listen don't pray to send God there if you're not willing to go if you're gonna pray put some feet on your prayers and you go you go to the hospital and visit you go to the uh, to the uh, prison and visit somebody you go to a nursing home and visit somebody take Jesus there in you let them see a Jesus with skin on somebody who can embrace them because they might the only understanding that they might get of the spirit might be wrapped in a flesh body and then they feel the warmth of the spirit of somebody who's taken the time not only to pray there but then go there you pray ahead and then you go you pray ahead and then you go and so you begin to ask you know God you know do something 
You need to be like Isaiah when God was saying, who will go for me? Whom will I send? And then he raised his hand, volunteered, and said, Lord, here am I. Send me. I dare you to give God permission to send you. And listen, I told you, the effectiveness of this church is not based on how many we seat. It is based on how many we send. The real work of ministry is done outside of the doors of the church. This is a schoolhouse where you come to be equipped and prepared, but the ministry of Jesus Christ, you got relatives strung out on dope. They need you coming, putting your arms around them, loving them, and speaking words of life to them, painting a picture of a special future for them, empowering them. They've heard enough negative words to the degree that they have believed those negative words and they need somebody who will believe in them, in the gift of God that is in their life, in the calling of God, in the divine potential. They are made in the image of God. They need to understand that there's a divinity that is in them and they are living ignorantly of the divinity of God that is in them and we are called to be fishers of men, to go and fish them out to where we find them deep down in the water. They're not gonna just hop in the boat. We can't just put a sign on the door of the church saying, everyone welcome, sinners welcome here. That would be just as stupid as putting a sign on the side of a boat saying, fish welcome here. You have to fish them out of the water. Fish them out. They don't just come out, they must be fished out. I will make you fishers of men. You ought to have a list of people that you are praying that God, I, this old barracuda here, this is the one I want. Give me this kingfish right here. This old grouper here, that old catfish over there, you ought to have a list. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Who's on your fishing list? What kind of fish are you going to fry tonight? And you ought to, you ought to just, just say, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm called, I'm a fisherman. I'm a fisherman. I am a fisherman. Somebody needs some shark steak. I know some people are mean as sharks and they take a bite out of everything that comes their way, but listen, they are a soul that needs to be redeemed. You don't know what that person will have been through. Everybody has a story. There's a reason that they are mean. Maybe somebody abandoned them and they, were, they had their trust broken and violated and they were hurt and abused and they need somebody to throw their arms around them and to speak life to them and to say, you know what, I realize that you're hurt. I'm trying to understand your world now because we judge people when we have too little information or no information at all and we judge them pointing the finger in their face, but we need to come in with tenderness and compassion and say, sweetheart, what's wrong with you? I, I, I understand. I know you probably didn't have this, did you? I know that I've been there myself. And, and when they can feel that somebody will change places and get off of your holy, sanctified horse and come down into the dirt, realizing that I know what it's like to be caught up in stuff and you can't even get out to be hurting and crying at nighttime and wanting somebody to help you and not knowing who to call. Jesus, I was just waiting on somebody. You got to understand what it's like to be a fish. You were a fish one day and somebody caught you. Maybe when we go with the right kind of bait, when you, God has given you different kind of armament in your spirit, down in your spirit, I dare you to be a person who will be sensitive to God when the person just needs to hear words that I love you. When somebody doesn't need to hear any words at all, they need somebody to take them by the hand. They need somebody to throw their arms around them and just hold them while they cry. They just need somebody. Sometimes what they need is a $20 bill slipped in their hand. You ought to just pray, God, show me the bait that I need to use when I go fishing, Jesus. Let me help them with their homework. Jesus, if I will help, to help them with their child, maybe God, just maybe, I'll be able to reach them. Remember, you are a fisherman, and the only reason that we're doing it is because Jesus would do it, and we are following him, and he makes us fishers of men. I've had to help people that I didn't feel like helping, but because I was following him, God will guide you with his eyes. He'll just look at somebody and then look back at you and say, you know what to do. Love them like I would love them. Tell them what I told you to tell them. Ask them if everything is all right. Come there and be my representation for them in the earth. When you are sensitive in your spirit, your spirit will know stuff that you don't get from a college or university. You don't get from distance learning online. You get because your spirit is hooked up to the eternal spirit 
of the living God, the one who says that the, the greater one, who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and above all that you can ask or think, and it is according to the power that works on the inside of you. There's something in you that he wants to use. There's something in you that he wants to use. Something that he wants to use. I dare you to begin just putting your prayers into act action. I dare you to have a time and a plan to grow spiritually. I dare you to listen to spiritual ministry every week. I dare you to read your Bible every day. I dare you to spend time with people that can honestly help you to grow. I dare you to apply what you learn in the spirit realm. Your Christian character is developed, hear me carefully, your Christian character is developed by the Word of God, it is developed by the presence of God, and it is developed by the people of God. I dare you to get around those who challenge you. I dare you to get around those folks that desire change in their own life. And I dare you to start measuring your provisions, not your problems. When Jesus was there with a multitude of people to feed, Jesus never told them to count the multitude. He asked them a question. How many loaves do you have? Don't look at the hillside loaded with people. Look at the basket. Don't count the crowd. Count the loaves. In other words, you use what you have and then God will multiply. Had they never tried to feed a few, they never would have fed the many. Uh, he didn't tell them to count their problems. He said, count your provisions. How many loaves do you have? Because he wanted their focus and their faith to be on what God had already provided. And if I can provide this for you, I can provide more. He was saying, how many loaves have you? Stop looking at your needs, the greatness of your need, and start looking at the greatness of your God. Stop looking at the, at the people and start looking at the provisions of what God has put on the inside of you. What you may have may not be much, but God has given you two pieces of fish and five barley loaves in you. You thought that that was just to feed you, but that thing is going to feed a multitude. You start breaking what you have and start sharing it with one and sharing it with another and sharing it with another, and you take it, and then they'll tell, tell somebody else what you told them that blessed them, and then you don't know how that thing will multiply in the lives of others. I dare you to start just breaking some of your wisdom off breaking some of your word off, breaking some of your testimony off, breaking some of your song off, and start sharing it with somebody else that is hungry, somebody that is starving. Because whenever you become successful, success easily produces complacency. Success easily produces complacency. So when God finds a person is complacent, God comes to disturb the comfortable but on the other end, he comes to comfort the disturbed. It is a double-edged sword that he can do both of them at the same time, two people in the same places. And I want you to realize that God wants you to accept some dares in your life. And do you know why that he wants you to accept some dares? Because if you were designed to stay in a comfort zone, Jesus never would have told us that I'm going to send back a comforter. You would need a comforter unless you were going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be in some phases in your life where you will be terribly uncomfortable. Because of relationships, because of finances, because of health, you're going to be in some situation, I promise you that, where you're going to be uncomfortable, where you're going to be threatened to lose everything that you've got. And God says, I will send the comforter if you were not going to be put in uncomfortable situations, you wouldn't need a comforter. But he knew that you would need a comforter because he knew that you cannot grow in a place of comfort, that you become complacent in a comfort zone. So God says, I will make you struggle and be uncomfortable so you will have a reason to have fellowship with my spirit. If you were not uncomfortable, you would never trust me for anything. You'd always walk by sight and never by your faith. He said, I wanted you to be uncomfortable so that I could send in the comforter. I know that you would hurt in some phases in your life. That's why I will send the comforter. He knew that there would be some disturbing situations 
that would happen to you in your life and that's why he sent a comforter don't ever forget that the comforter is with you the God of all comfort has already sent the comforter and so I want to say to you go and do something uncomfortable thank you for watching power for living with Bishop Dale C Bronner until next time God bless you